it became apparent to me as uh, one of the phrases my dad had was, it was just a time to uh, move over into the shoulder so that other people can use the driving lane and the passing lane and get out of the way. And so that became my role was to uh, really step aside from day-to-day -day activities and become a lot more involved in um, our corporate governance and our business structure and our ownership structure and all those sorts of things. Welcome to the Family Business Connection, a Prairie Family Business Association podcast where we lift up the stories behind family businesses who thrive for generations. I'm your host, Stephanie Larshide. On Family Business Connection, we explore the topics our family business members request most often. Communication, culture, innovation, leadership, strategy, and succession by hearing from the family business leaders who are solving problems day in and day out and building a legacy for their businesses and their families. In this episode, we welcome TJ Russell, the chairman and fourth generation owner of Cloverdale. The Mandan, North Dakota-based food company creates high quality, flavorful meat products that include bacon, their specialty, sausage, deli meats, and snacks. In our conversation, we talked about how the nearly 110-year-old company has reached the Century Club status and what lessons and philosophies have been handed down through generations. We also discuss how Cloverdale formed an advisory board in 2023, as well as what it takes to have a high-functioning executive team made up of both family and non-family key leaders. Thanks for joining us in this episode of Family Business Connection. Before we get into my conversation with TJ, here's a word from our sponsor, Will Kate. Will Kate helps families purposefully plan for generations using a holistic, humanistic approach. We regularly refer family businesses to founder Agatha Johnson and her team. Will Kate understands families and business together and uses their six element focus to create the fullest value of your wealth. What are the six elements? Personal growth, family, heritage, values, community, financial, and structural. Will Kate is here to assist in building a lasting legacy. Visit will-kate.com to learn more about their work with families. Welcome to our episode. We're very happy to have TJ Russell, the fourth generation of ownership and leadership of Cloverdale. Welcome, TJ. Well, thanks, Stephanie. Glad to be here. We have a lot to cover. We have a, nearly 110 years of history with Cloverdale that we get to talk about today, which is fascinating. You've reached Century Club status. That doesn't happen to just any family business. It takes a lot of hard work, sweat, and tears to get to where you are today. So we want to hear a little bit more about that. You're sitting here, fourth generation. You have some fifth generation involvement. You're 100, nearly 110 years old. How does that feel? It feels like we're just getting started, and I, I don't know that one podcast will do. Maybe this will be a series. So maybe this is part one of yes. season one. Yes, Episode I like that. One. Yes. <laughs> you know, we, we've had so many uh, rebirths of our company over the course of 110 years, as anybody has that's, that's been around this long. Uh, what started off as a creamery and... Uh, butter business a hundred plus years ago uh, became a small meat interest in the late fifties. So we just went from 1915 to 1959, if you will, when we started off in the meat business. And then sometime in the in the sixties and seventies, we began distribution to local and area and regional grocery stores and restaurants where, of course, we were distributing mostly things that we made as well as things uh, other people made. And that became our business model for a long time, 1970-ish to 1995. So, wow, we just, we just fast-forwarded like 80-some uh, years and just a couple of minutes on here. And since 1995, we have had one and only business interest, and that's the meat company. 
and that's Cloverdale Meats, Cloverdale Foods, as, as you and I know it. And Cloverdale has really become a world-class bacon manufacturer, bacon marketer. And my, my brother, Scott, has this saying that uh, bacon tastes great whether you're in Portland, Maine, or in Portland, Oregon. And other categories that we're in, be it summer sausage, or smoked sausage, or dinner sausage, there's so many varieties and regional interests and tastes and things like that, that the catalog could be super exhausting. So about 10 plus years ago, Scott really began a mission of getting us bacon centric. And that's what we are today. We're well over half our business today. Wow. And people love their bacon. I know there are we bacon fests really across the country. We, we, have, we have worked exceptionally hard at it. We, we bring in some of the um, most thought of experts in the country for different phases of how bacon is produced. Uh, we are doing things as close to world-class, best-in-class as is thought of throughout the country. That's fascinating. And, and then, and it's an it's an incredible facility in Mandan, North Dakota, uh, sister city to the state capital of Bismarck, right on the Missouri River. So we're awfully proud of our frontier heritage and things like that. How many employees are you at, TJ? Little, you know, we, we're plus or minus five hundred on any uh, at any given time. We'll continue to probably grow a little bit north of that. Uh, That's great. You mentioned your brother Scott. He currently sits in the CEO position of Cloverdale, and the two of you are the fourth generation who are involved primarily. Talk a little bit about your family involvement. Sure. Uh, Brother Scott has been our president CEO since 2017. And uh, prior to that, I had been our president CEO chairman uh, from the late 90s uh, until that time. And it was really important for me, a lesson I had learned from my dad was that when, when there is a wave of energy and leadership and management that is present, and quite frankly, I was, I was running out of a little bit of steam. And uh, Scott and the team that he had been recruiting were on fire. And it um, it became apparent to me as uh, one of the phrases my dad had was, there's just a time to uh, move over into the shoulder so that other people can use the driving lane and the passing lane and get out of the way. And so that became my role was to uh, really step aside from day-to-day -day activities and become a lot more involved in um, our corporate governance and our business structure and our ownership structure and all those sorts of things. And you've really taken that to heart, especially the last couple of years. We've experienced that through our, my relationship with you, TJ, and through your relationship with Prairie Family Business Association. That governance has taken front and center, that you've done the hard work to get to this point. Now what's next? What do the next 50 and 100 years look like? What excites you about that vision? What's really remarkable about that process was um, how intense we took, how intense we put our arms around it. And um, I've, I've come to learn that when Scott and I are really engaged in something and we really want it for what's best for the company, uh, we are capable of really rolling up our sleeves because this was a new endeavor for us. There, there had, it's not like we had never had a board. There had been uh, boards of management in the past and uh, boards of, you know, bankers and things like that in the past, way, way back. This was going to be a board of advisors. And we had some simple rules that we learned from Larry Haas through the, the board school that I attended uh, from May of 21 until April of 22. And in board school, one of the things I picked up from Larry Haas and, and the others was 
Uh, we were going to pick somebody from the outside. They couldn't have anything to do with Cloverdale. So nobody we knew, no accounts, no local bankers, um, people that had an interest and a passion for the food business. Didn't have to be the meat business. Didn't have to be sausage or bacon experts by any means. And um, in that process, we used a consultant that we had gotten to know through Prairie Family Business. And she was also one of the um, instructors of the board school. And in that process, uh, I got to be really comfortable with her. And so we engaged her, Cloverdale engaged her to help us write our owner's plan, which was a result of the board school, write our owner's um, we have two different. We have an owner's plan for owners, and we have a, a slightly, slightly, slightly different version owner's plan for management. And very clean, simple, concise, uh, well written pieces. I tried to do that completely on my own throughout board school, and had about 17, 18, 19 versions of it that were really, really lengthy, exhaustingly lengthy, unnecessary for us. And so um, Sandra helped us really button that up. We got it cleaned up uh, sometime in early 2022, presented that to the other shareholders. And we began the journey to, as a result of that said, we want to bring in an advisory board. Same consultant, Sandra helps us uh, put together advisory board, uh, role description, job description, if you will, it goes out. We have like 200 people interested. In it. She peruses those interested two, three page applicants and submits 23 of them to Scott and I. Uh, we get to about nine that really have caught our eye. And we're zeroed in on five. And now we're splitting hairs. Now we're down to three that we can't, uh, we can't, it's hard to pick. And so we ended up picking two out of those three. And through another relationship, we ended up with a third that uh, has been exceptionally instrumental. And so now your board is five people. Is that correct? It's the advisory board is three. Uh, and plus Scott and I guess would be five. Yes. That's great. And I know Sandra McNeely has done great work to get you to this point. And that's often what it takes is that that outside facilitator third party to, to move things forward. Um, you wear a lot of hats, TJ, and one of the hats that we would consider you wear is what we call CFO, Chief Family Organizer. And you need somebody in that role who's moving the conversation forward. And you have, since you left the CEO role in 2017, you've really dug into that. And it's such an important thing that that families need to take into consideration I think that sometimes they, you know, you put it to the back burner and you say, what's next? And in your, when, when you stepped away, putting yourself fully into family work is huge for, for Cloverdale, for the Russell family and for the future of your family business. And that's what we really want to encourage families that, that when they get to that next stage, whether they call it my reinvention, my retirement, whatever the case may be, it doesn't stop there that some of the most important work that they can do for the family and the business starts at that point when they step away from the day-to-day -day leadership of the business. And you're an example of that, TJ. I'm really excited for what you've done and what you're doing and, and for other families to take that example and run with it. Well, thank you. And, and quite frankly, uh, without, you know, first of all, uh, from a business standpoint, I was very lucky and very fortunate that I had a brother who was an exceptional executive and an exceptional leader and had the energy and the passion to put together the best possible team that the company could put together. And he was very passionate about that and worked hard at that. And he engaged with the table group, Patrick Lencioni's uh, offshoot company, and the table group kind of became one of his guiding forces from monthly to quarterly meetings and uh, things of that nature to daily check-ins. And, and uh, that helped him and his executive team really become um, a, a force uh, in our company and in our, in our business. 
And I, and I would put that executive team up against uh, anybody in the food business today. They're really exceptional. I've heard you brag about your leadership team and how phenomenal they are. And I think that's key that you've really put the best and the brightest around you and filled in the, the areas of expertise that you knew the company needed and that you needed, knew needed to complement what you and Scott brought to the table. So talk a little bit about that leadership team, your key non-family leaders. Sure. I, and, and just, and, just, and, and uh, prior to that, um, let me rewind the tape just a smidge here. Um, I, I was very fortunate in life to have, uh, quite frankly, found the love of my life at an early age. And so I knew when I was very young who I was going to marry. I was in love with this girl. I was smitten with her. My allegiance to her um, is unquestionable. And so my wife, Gina, became my not just my lifelong uh, partner in marriage and, and, and um you know, bringing up our kids and being that um, person that was always going to be at home, she was gave me the opportunity to devote myself to work as much as I did. And um, it was kind of, I, I don't want to say it was a different era back then, but the, the mid-90s was a time when you had to go see people. You had to go shake hands and kiss babies and and so you you had to be a road warrior. That's just the way it was. And so for me to spend 100 to 150 days a year on the road was just what you did. It's what our salespeople did. Uh, their customers weren't at home. They were somewhere else. You had to go see them and write orders. It was just you know, mano a mano. And so that style of, of sales was just embedded in our DNA at Cloverdale. That's not how it is today, but that's how we built the base of business um, from the West Coast to the Midwest and, uh, and so on. And today it's a, it's a completely different model of selling and marketing. But I, I had that support system at home that really gave me the time and the freedom and the energy to do what I had to do to um, reinvigorate our company. In the mid-90s, we were stuck, and uh, we, we needed some kind of accelerant to get us moving. And then it happened again in the, in the 2015, 16, uh, and so on. And that's when Scott's, you know, surfaced, and he, had, he was recruiting people within the company um, and, and working with them. And then he went outside of the company and brought other executives in. That have just been tremendous. You're the, oh, the, the, question. the spouse who was alongside for every piece of it is such a big player in how the, the business and the family turn out. And that's a big piece of what your story is, TJ, and along with Gina. And I know that there's ownership, um, the two of you have, um, and some interests and the, some business decisions that the two of you have made um, jointly as husband and wife. And now you have a fifth generation of your family. Talk about that, their involvement. Sure. And then we'll circle back to the executive team in a little more detail. Uh, I, I kind of skipped over that question. But yes, my, my son Brock um, you know, kind of came up through the ranks. He went to college at uh, NDSU. Uh, played football uh, for them kind of during some of their heyday uh, era when they won a few titles. And then he joined the food safety team at Cloverdale. And he was part of the food safety uh, group day-to-day uh, -day for about a year. And then he jumped into the promotional um, side of the company. We were dragging a 40-foot trailer around the Midwest doing shows at uh, Hy-Vee in the parking lot or Hornbachers in the parking lot or, you know, Cub Foods in a parking lot. And anywhere we, where we could get a yes, we would do demos in parking lots, primarily at grocery stores. We, we did some food service events, like we'd show up at a convention center in uh, Cloquet, Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota, and be part of that food service show. Um, but he did that for a couple of years, and then an opportunity surfaced in sales. And he took that on and began we, we didn't really have much of a presence with Walmart, and he kind of got us cooking. We went from a few Walmart stores to 20, 30, 40 stores to uh, eventually he had us in three or 400 stores. 
Wow. And then that forced, that forced Walmart to put us in their distribution centers, mm -hmm. at least on the higher velocity products. And then um, we replaced him in that role, and he took on um, what we call the Pacific Northwest. So, so, so basically everything from Billings, Montana, to Seattle, down to San Diego. And so that West Coast geography kind of became his. And um, he's he's really grown up in that role. He, he manages a, a, we call it a book of business. And all of our salespeople in the organization, whether it's a food service or a retail sales rep, they have brokers scattered throughout the country. And those brokers are, are sales reps for rent, so to speak. And that broker network is, um, it's a, it's a love hate affair. Yeah. We, we love them when they're really working and selling a lot of stuff. And uh, we don't like them as much when we're butt heads and they're not selling. So, so he's, he, in, a good he's in the broker. midst of it. Yeah. He's really working foot to pavement, making sales happen. And, and that's great to have your fifth Can generation. I've often said whether I've, whether it's, uh, working or visiting with the younger sales reps like Brock. He's not younger anymore. She's just 31, so he's been at it a little while. Uh, but whether, you know, whether you're, you're young like Brock or whether I'm talking to a, a, uni a freshman class of university business students, um, I encourage people to find a job in sales early in your career, and you will find out more about the company you're working for from that sales job. You will find out a lot about your products, good, bad, or different. You'll find out a lot about your service, good or bad. You'll find out a lot about the company. That's do they pay great. their bills? Do your customers pay their bills? Yeah. You will find out more about your accounting system when um, somebody doesn't pay you than you will when they do pay you. That's next-gen advice right there that our next-gens can take, take to heart, TJ. When, when you talk about your executive team, the, you can talk about them, you know, at a high level of, of the people you have at the table and some of the experiences they've brought to help you as Cloverdale get to the next level. One of the fun things I think your executive team has dealt with um, this summer was going viral through the Minnesota Twins. So perhaps you can incorporate that into your leadership oh team conversation as well. Gosh, where do I start with that one? So I got to... So we've been a we we are big fans of sports marketing, and we have been in arena and in sports marketing um, since the nineteen eighty nine we fest. Wow! So wow, we have we have had an interest in arena and sports marketing for a long time, and uh, we we kind of buttoned up some of our regional arenas that we are involved in. And we went after Bigger Fish, the Minnesota Twins, and we became a Minnesota Twins bacon sponsor, which they had never had, but uh, it was important for us to focus on bacon. And lo and behold, this year, um, as the Minnesota Twins had a run of success, our Cloverdale Tangy Supper Sausage became part of the story. And it went viral, and it was crazy, and it was a lot of fun. And... I guess if you own the uh, that Lucky Rabbit's foot and, and you're the company that owns it at the time, somebody goes on a winning streak, um, you deal with that uh, short-term fame for as long as you can. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a fun story all throughout the, the Midwest and beyond. Yes. How did it result in sales? Did you see any uptick? Um, you know, I, I would say that we had some... There was an interest, especially in that market, in in making sure that uh, our customers in that market wanted to make sure that they had the right products, close to thing, summer sausage. They wanted to make sure that they had that product on ad at that time. And so we probably got a little bump in additional ads and, you know, all those sorts of things. And uh, so, yeah, we got we got a little bit of a lift out of it. It's uh, that's for sure. We had obviously a lot of headlines and a lot of noise and you know, things like that in social media that a doesn't always fun. translate into you know, what goes across the uh, scanner at the grocery mm -hmm. store, or, you know, but it's a, uh, you know what you do? You never, you never run away from a headline. So. No, you'll take that buzz any way it comes. 
Absolutely. You talked about several rebirths within Cloverdale throughout the years. And kind of as we wrap up this part of the conversation, what are some key points that you reflect on that has gotten Cloverdale to where it is today and that you want to carry forward as part of the future and the legacy? Well, I think, um, you know, sometimes when I listen to um, maybe somebody new with the company or maybe somebody that's a little bit younger with the company and and people think, boy, you know, we're so stuck in the way we do things that we don't ever make changes. And I think back over the course of my longevity, I think about, geez, in December of 1995, we had a food service arm of the company and the meat division of the company. That's what Clover was. So we were selling groceries and frozen foods and napkins and we were just like Cisco or Food Service of America. And um, we had decided at that time we were just going to be a meat company. We we're just going to invest in that. And so we sold off the food service company to our arch rivals, both in North Dakota and we had a small company in Wichita, Kansas and sold off both of those companies to those arch rivals. And we went backwards in sales. We we wow. went. We were half the size we were um, on December first, nineteen ninety-five. Completely different company. And I look back and well, I don't know. So I think back to some of the changes we've made. Up. I thought that was a pretty big one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, fast forward some years, we were for a long time, twenty, thirty years. We were very, very connected to the local farmer, the local rancher. Uh, the pork producers, hog producers in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. We processed about 3,000 pigs a week at a facility in Minot, North Dakota. And uh, my dad was very fascinated with uh, the process of uh, harvesting pigs. And I became very connected with that. I became very connected with the ag industry throughout the Dakotas and and, uh, Minnesota, Montana, and the Prairie Provinces. And so Killing, processing pigs uh, was just part of my DNA, a part of the company's DNA. And then having that connection to the, the farm and the ranch helped my story when I was in Seattle or when I was mm-hmm. in L.A. or whatever the case yes. might be. You know, we were connected to the farm and the ranch. And we had a Cloverdale um, Growers Co-op from 1996 until... Um, 2000 and June of 2010. Wow. And the Minot plant got hit with the flood when all those floods kind of hit the North Dakota in 2010, excuse me, 2011. So June of 2011, uh, the Missouri was flooding in Bismarck, Banyan, North Dakota. The the Suarez River up in Minot, North Dakota was also flooding. And our plant was um, inundated with flood water. Not not like four feet deep, but you had to shut the place down. And uh, the city of Minot had some, there were some issues with infrastructure, and we did not have water for six months. Wow. So it's, it's pretty hard to run a business that is dependent on about 20,000 gallons a day. Wow. Out of water. So we, you know, we lost the pig barn. We, well, it actually got cleaned out is what happened. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's one way to put it. You know, one way to put it. Yeah. But, you know, so there is some chapters. So interesting story. So our Minot plant was a supplier to the Mandan processing plant. We treated it like a vendor. Minot got paid whatever the fair market value was for pork bellies, pork legs, pork trim, et cetera, et cetera. So Minot was a vendor to Mandan. Mandan was always a bigger buyer of pork bellies than Minot could buy or could sell us. So we knew how to treat Minot fairly. Um, it was a, it was a, a vendor supplier type relationship. We shut that Minot plant down on like Monday, June twentieth, and we completely replaced it as a supplier in about three or four days. Wow! It was unbelievable. Wow! And a lot of hard work, a lot of um, hits and misses. But it showed us an important lesson about how fast in this business we are replacing at almost any size. Mm. And I I still talk about that today sometimes when I'm with people. Don't ever forget, man, if if, if we disappeared, our customers, uh, it might be inconvenient for a couple hours, 
maybe a couple days, maybe even a couple of weeks. But it won't be inconvenient to them for a long time. Mm. We could be replaced. It's a that's the business year. So Yeah, it's an interesting it's, perspective and it, it captures the power of storytelling as you're talking to, to new employees who didn't experience that and, and family even. It's sharing that story among your generations. So I've got a couple of different chapters that kind of come to mind in terms of a rebirth of the company. Uh, you know, the, the, re, the rebirth in 1995 when we became a meat company only. So what, we, what are we supposed to work on? We, that's all we had to work on. And then in 2011, when the hog plant went away and, you know, there was, that was a $10, $15 million uh, business that went to zero and uh, hmm. quickly. And we replaced that business and we continued to grow. It was unbelievable. It was, it was just, and it, it, it probably proves a point that Scott had been making for a long time. If we would get simpler, it would get better. Mm. And he really began this mission of bacon first. He began this mission really in 2003, probably. And he kept honing away on it and honing away on it and getting the right people behind it. And, um, we are now that today. What he yeah. was talking about as long ago as 2003 really started coming to fruition. And probably when I got out of the way, <laughs> you know, some, sometimes you got to get the right people out of the way so that others can really hone in on what might be best for the company. And uh, sure as I'm sitting here, that's what we're doing today. Yeah, that innovation and strategy is, is huge. And, and doing the, what the, you the do best. The, the dedication to... A category, the baking category. I mean, we used to have this business prospecting pipeline that had categories all over the place. Um, so today, our, our salespeople have a bacon business prospecting pipeline that uh, is expected to be um, rich. Well, I hope our listeners can go enjoy some good Cloverdale bacon after listening to this or recognize that that is what they are enjoying on their next bacon bite. Well, good. We've reached the part of the episode where we'll talk about the family business five. So we have five questions we ask all our guests. So to start us off, TJ, what's a book that has greatly influenced your life? A long time ago. And I can't remember Ken Blanchard's uh, book where he talked about lead with your head, your heart, your hands, and your habits. And that was something that stuck with me forever. And while I've read a number of business titles over the years, for sure, as, as many have, I, I became somewhat fascinated with Ken Blanchard's simple, you know, head, heart, hands, and habits. And uh, if, if I've done anything uh, over the course of time, it's probably those uh, three, four things. He and a great family business man and Ken Blanchard as well. He's greatly influenced the field of family business. And I was I was surprised one day. I was um, I was at a leadership uh, discussion with Sister Thomas from uh, University of Mary, and she was a fan of Ken Blanchard. And she kind of had uh, uh, hands and habits kind of boiled into one. So she used a triangle, and she used, you know, head, heart, and then hands and habits were in the same point of the triangle. But she was a, a fan of Ken Blanchard, and she was a phenomenal gifted speaker. And so Sister Thomas uh, kind of became that um, one of those old leadership uh, engines that spark you from a local standpoint. Yeah, and you can share that, that Ken Blanchard in commonality. Right. Through Prairie Family Business, what program or experience has provided the most value to you, TJ? Well, I, I think, um, you know, the, the one that stands out for me is the uh, year-long board school that myself and, and many, many others attended. And then I'll, I'll never forget that the board school on in April of 22, when all of us from board school presented to our peers in the room, I said to my peers, I said, I don't want to stand here in April of 2023 and tell you the same story that I'm telling you now. I want my story and our story to have moved a little bit. I don't know how much it's going to be, 
Maybe we'll move a little, maybe we'll move a lot. But my expectations are to not be in front of you and tell you the same thing. And I, I kind of rinse and repeat that in just other areas of life in general. I don't want to, I want to sound like I've moved a little bit for God's sakes and have done, made some progress. Um, so I kind of presented that as a challenge to myself. So Prairie Family Business was very persistent about board school thought, boards in general. And the first several conferences I went to, it scared me to death. Um, I was very comfortable with the way Scott and I um, conducted or didn't conduct boards, per se, board <laughs> meetings. And, and, and the more comfortable I, came, I became with some of my peers, um, Paul Steffes and the Steffes organization is, is one of those um, organizations from uh, family, corporate governance, board attention, attention to detail, uh, leadership. Uh, their organization is one of those that for people like me, you know, that's one of those that sits up on a fireplace mantle and you go, geez, you know, someday I kind of want to be like, I want to be like Paul Steffes and the Steffes organization. They're very, very highly, highly thought of. Craig Larson from Starian Bank, um, he was part of a peer group that I was involved in early on. And, and the things that he was doing within his family, within his board and the company, was very inspiring and, and uh, scary because I wasn't doing it. In Florida, I wasn't doing it. And I was afraid of, of what it would take to do that and to go there. Now that I'm five going on six quarterly board meetings. The sixth one will be next month. Um, I'm, I'm so glad we did it when we did it. Our executive team now has three unbelievable people in business that they can bounce ideas off of. Because I'm not the right guy to bounce some of this stuff off. Let's be honest. And so when we have something that's really big and really hairy that needs to be, get uh, thrown through the wheel a little bit. Our executive team, just in the last two or three weeks, just in the last two or three weeks, has spent time with one, two, three different uh, advisory board members, either together or individually. Group calls, teams calls, they're available and they're knowledgeable. And they come from a place that we've not been. When we recruited our advisory board, uh, we wanted them to come from either divisions or companies that were substantially larger than us. We wanted their experience to be, have more commas or more zeros, whatever you want to say. And so our executive team has engaged with them. They've engaged with our executive team. They're not afraid to call and say, what are you doing? No. Yeah. And, and they're invested and they'll take those calls and they'll give yeah. their insights. And that's part of the power of the board. And I well, think family business, the number one product to me, has been, number one, has always been the conference in April. That's a, I, I, I know more people today that schedule parts of their life around that week in April. Hmm. People return from Florida that week because they want to be there for that. Uh, people miss other meetings, schedule other meetings because of, that week that Prairie Family Business has that conference. There isn't, I, I, I've yet to walk away from that conference and have somebody go, well, that was a bust. I didn't, what did you, what did I show up for? Doesn't happen. The, the product uh, that you and your staff put together, that's number one. Number two for me has been um, anything and everything that Prairie Family has put together relative to boards. And um, let's be honest, families don't like, we don't like bosses. We don't. We don't be like being accountable to somebody. And, and that, are and that you? Has, that has made Clover more accountable. It has made our company more accountable because we have this. We we are scheduled with board meetings through twenty twenty five. Everybody knows it. The executive team presents to the advisory board every quarter. Um, they work hard at getting prepared and preparing for. And they're getting more comfortable with it. And our, our advisory board is, they, they are not, um, they're not there to just listen. They will stop a meeting and ask questions and say, why, why did you, 
Why did you do that? We told you it was a bad idea. <laughs> There's that accountability. Yes. Yep. It, we can't agree with you more on what a board can do for a family business. So that's business. why, and there's a lot of other great products and, and your resources that come out of your family business, but I'm going to keep it to two. The annual conference and uh, board education, board facility, uh, board, you call it what you want. If you're interested in fine-tuning what you have, engage with somebody at Prairie Family Business. If you want to start one, Wait. ask me what it feels like to stand on the cliff and jump off. I, I know what the water temp is like. And you know how it feels after a and couple of years of it. Mm -hmm. yep. Fulfillment, reward, exactly. all the above. April 30th and May 1st, 2025. Mark your calendars for our 33rd annual Family Business Conference. All right, so we got through one or two questions. We got through two. <laughs> uh, if you can just sum up a person or uh, just a time and place of what you most attribute the success of Cloverdale to or what you're most proud of or who you're most proud of, what would that be? One person? I would, I, I would have to say... Um, the, the people in our company are, are loaded with grit and determination. And while our family might, um, represent the ownership of the company, the, the people that show up for work 24 seven, 365, and whether it's 2024 or whether it's 1924, there have been people that have been that that have raised their families uh, through our company. There have often been times when there have been more fam far more family members with other last names, mm -hmm. with mom and dad, sons and daughters, in laws, cousins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's been the, the far 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 more families that work within the company than our family in terms of number of people. But by and large, I think one of the things you find in the Midwest and, and in family business in general is that um, people like to work with people that uh, are determined and are passionate about sustaining and building and growing. And I think by and large, whether it was 1924 or 2024, um, I think the people up and down, you know, we're here to serve. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're here to serve and we wanted to, you know, continue to build and establish a company that um, has lots of people that can, you know, feed their families and live life the way they want. It all boils down to the people. That is certain. What's a lesson from a family member that's stuck with you for our final question? Oh my gosh, what's one lesson from a family person? <laughs> um, yeah, keep keep your head screwed on. You're, you're not as important as you think, and you're not as big as you think. Is it's, that from your dad? Uh, <laughs> I can think of... <laughs> 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 there, there's there's been a few family members from, from my mom and dad to uh, 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 maybe a brother, uh, possibly a wife. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not as smart as I think I am. And um, you know what? You're, you're here to serve, you know, show up, do a good job. And, um, you know, people will be there for you. It, it, that's what it all boils down to. And, and that keeping that humility in check and, we're all here for the greater good. We're here for the people, the people who are making the business happen and the people around us every day. And I'm I'm proud of the work that you and Cloverdale have put in, TJ. It's paying off. 
and it will continue to. I'm excited for what the future holds and I can sense the fulfillment that you feel in the work that you've been doing related to the family business. Uh, so keep it up. This has been a great conversation. It's a great Thank story you. to tell of a family business from Mandan, North Dakota, who's reached nearly 110 years old. Um, doesn't happen every day and it's something to celebrate. So thank you so much, TJ. Well, thank you. This has been terrific. And on that note, we've reached the end of the episode. Thank you to TJ for sharing his family's more than 100-year-old history with Cloverdale Foods and what lessons have stood the test of time to be passed down through generations, as well as what it takes to form high-functioning executive teams and advisory boards. Join Prairie Family Business Association for an action-packed two days full of family business inspiration and motivation that will transform your thinking around communication, succession, relationships, and the future of your family business at the 2025 Annual Family Business Conference on April 30th and May 1st. Now at the Steel District, Canopy by Hilton Hotel in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you'll want to register for your tickets at the lowest price of the year. Learn more and register at fambus.org 2025. Thanks again for joining us today. Our inaugural season of the Family Business Connection will be 10 episodes featuring stories of all kinds of family business leaders. Be sure to follow or subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts.